in listen only mode. Hello everyone, it's Friday, December 2nd. I'm David Song, currency analyst with Daily FX. Here to cover the highly anticipated U.S. non-farm payrolls, uh, which is also going to be accompanied by Canada's employment report as well. So, you know, we'll see the series of data hit the wires at 8.30 Eastern uh, in under just 15 minutes. Uh, here's current market expectations, guys. Uh, I'll personally be keeping a close eye on these overall figures for the U.S. labor market. And, you know, there are some themes I want to talk about here, uh, especially for the week ahead as we do face... Uh, some key event risk going into end of the end of the year, uh, but for now, current market projections for the U.S. non-farm payrolls report, the jobless rate we're looking for that to hold steady at an annualized 4.9 percent. Uh, we saw that slow down from an annualized 5.0 percent last time around. Uh, again, it was accompanied by a downtick in the labor force participation rate. So, you know, we'll see if that will also occur this time around. Uh, but for now, the key number that I'm personally going to watch will be, again, what's happening not only with employment. We're going to see a bit of a pickup, you know, especially with some seasonal factors maybe at play, right? The holiday shopping season are going to see, you know, a boost, a meaningful pickup, if you will, in especially part-time positions based on some of those seasonal factors but you know we'll watch the wage growth figures here as well the average hourly earnings figures and just to give you guys a bit of backdrop on this number you know we got that uptick to 2.8 percent last time around uh, this is actually the fastest pace of growth that we've seen since june of 2000 uh, 2014 if my memory serves me correctly so you know we'll see if we get a further pickup in household earnings and you know I think there's a lot to take away this week we've got the OPEC meeting this week a lot of better than expected US data prints you know whether you want to talk about the upward revision for third quarter GDP whether you want to talk about ISM yesterday the consumer confidence survey so you know a lot to take away this week We'll see if non-farm payrolls will, you know, really, really follow along with the better than expected prints that we've been pretty much seeing all all along out of the U.S. economy. Again, ADP employment was also better than expected. We'll see if that will also be reflected with non-farm payrolls. Out of Canada, uh, just be mindful we are looking for, I'm seeing the forecast range between 15, 20 K. Uh, but let's not forget, we've seen these figures blow out market expectations. They have been coming in much, much stronger than expected for the last three months. So even last time around, we were looking for a small contraction. We actually saw employment jump by 43.9K. But you know, as you guys can see from the metrics here, part-time positions led that advance. Again, full-time positions contract 23.1K. So we'll see how that will all fare. Also, we'll begin Canada's Labor Productivity Survey for the third quarter at the same time, looking for a bit of a rebound. Of course, after we saw that economic contraction in the second quarter for Canada following the Alberta fire. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how markets react to some of the data prints here. Uh, but again, on my end, really interested to see how this will not only impact near-term price action, but of course, the broader outlook for monetary policy. So uh, before we move into the charts, let me just get some house cleaning things out of the way. So you know, if you guys are paying attention to, of course, what's going to happen, water expectations for the Federal Reserve's December 14th interest rate decision, wide expectations that we will get, again, something similar to last year, this December rate hike at the FOMC. Uh, but you know, I spent some time going over this during my webinar on Wednesday, uh, my weekly Q&A. You know, I will argue that, you know, we'll see whether or not there'll be a further pickup for 2017 interest rate expectations. And, you know, I think that's going to be the most meaningful development out of the Federal Reserve this time around is with markets, again, largely pricing the September rate hike, the fresh projections. And again, this is a quarterly rate decision that we'll get with the Federal Reserve. And I think that will take a lot of the attention. And, um, you know, we're having discussion throughout the week at the desk, you know, is the series of better than expected data this week really um, moving expectations for 2017? So, yeah, I guess we can argue 40, 50% just about priced in starting from June of next year of when we could get the next Fed rate hike. But we'll see if non farm payrolls really change the needle for 2017 expectations. And again, until we get into June period, it's relatively low. So, again, even until May of next year, expectations currently are for the Fed or Again, another rate hike by the Fed stands just about at 23% probability, 24% probability. And it's not really until we get into June that, you know, we start seeing this sort of 40, 50% probability that will that be, again, the next time the Fed looks to raise the benchmark interest rate. So, of course, 
not only will we again pay attention or need to pay attention to price action, but continue to watch these expectations. But you know, even if we scroll all the way out to November here, guys, and this is you know the sort of bigger point that I was making is I can't really see markets are you know really heavily pricing a sort of series of rate hikes for 2017. So again, we'll see if some of the data will really in fact in for or reinforce an improved outlook for the US economy. We'll see if, again, that will really move the need for interest rate expectations. But uh, here's some pairs that I'm watching right now. Of course, I, I usually like to watch the euro dollar, especially when we come into some key event risk. You know, it's, I would argue, maybe the most popular FX pair. So, you know, compared to its other counterparts, maybe a little bit more liquid, especially, again, the fact that NFP always comes out on a Friday, right? Or usually comes out on a Friday unless there's a holiday. Uh, but, you know, here's some majors that I'll look at going into the key print for today. So, you know, we've seen Eurodollar try to make this recovery after we fail to get into that 105 handle. And, you know, let's not forget, guys, that's, again, we just stalled ahead of that December low of last year. So are we in for your near-term are we in for a near-term recovery? Yeah, it could be. Again, we're getting this nice rebound in the RSI. It continues to come off of over sold territory so uh, you know we're getting a nice rebound in the RSI as well moving in tandem with price so for now I'll call this a near-term recovery but you know, I've been talking about this all week looks more like a bear flag to me so you know broader bias for me at least on the euro dollar tilts to the downside but you know for now we've been largely struggling to really get this closing price above 106.60 so the way I look at it if we get a bullish US dollar response maybe we can see euro dollar try to pair that advance from the previous day, maybe track back to the lows of the week. So, you know, bullish US dollar reaction, you know, I'll certainly keep close on the euro dollar for that, but vice versa, if we do see maybe a bearish US dollar reaction, the one pair that I do like kind of watching right now where, you know, I think we're seeing some interesting signs here is cable. So, you know, after we've, we're stubbornly stuck in this very tight range throughout the previous week, uh, personally, I thought we could see this Relief rally and cable start to unwind here, but you know we we starting to get some interesting headlines out of the UK again. That you know it looks as though officials there, officials out in the euro area, are really trying or really trying to mitigate the risk of a hard Brexit. So on that front, we saw that pop yesterday. We'll see if the sort of relief rally will continue, uh, but doing a pretty good job of clinging on to this bullish formation here. So if we do see a bearish US dollar formation, maybe we could see a run back towards those weekly highs for cable. Uh, so that's the way I'll look at it. Again, bullish US dollar response, maybe keep a close eye on uh, the euro dollar, bearish US dollar response. I like, and again, these are my personal views, not a recommendation from Daily Effects, but you know, KB, cable might be worthwhile watching to see if we could get another move back above this sort of near-term Fibonacci overlap that I've been watching. 2620, 26.30 hurdle. We'll see if we get a little bit more of a meaningful pickup from here. And a good segue into, I hope I don't, chop up your name here, uh, Foizel, Faisal, I think, maybe? Apologies if I chopped up your name, saying, uh, hello, David, I'm looking to get back into, again, potential dollar, yen, pound, dollar, if the report comes out. Um, again, sparks a meaningful reaction here. And also, I'm watching pound, yen, top side, euro, dollar, to the downside. So I'll try to cover as most of these majors as I possibly can. Uh, ahead of the release here. So for now, there is one thing that I'm watching for cable. So not only am I watching this sort of, and I'm not going to lie to you guys, I thought this could have been a bearish formation here, a bear flag pattern like what's happening in the euro dollar. But, you know, given the recent sort of pickup that we're seeing in the exchange rate, I'm watching that RSI very carefully because I think we could be getting or on the cusp of getting a meaningful sort of bullish signal here is if we see that oscillator finally try to break out of this bearish formation that we have carried over from all the way back in May. Could that highlight a larger recovery on our hands? Of course, but again, bigger, broader picture on my end. Still relatively bearish for cable, but again, are we in for a larger recovery from here? Have we made a meaningful low, especially following that bearish pound flash crash that we had back in October, right? So with that said, let me just quickly try to run through the dollar yen as well. And, you know, just being mindful of what's happening here, right? Not only are we seeing this yen weakness, but to be honest, I think we're seeing yen weakness accompanied by euro weakness. So what's going on here? And I've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, what I think it's happening. And, you know, I think right now, beyond the fundamentals, if you will, right? We've, we're getting all this data prints. Next week, we have the European Central Bank on tap who's widely expected to extend the deadline of the quantitative easing program. So, you know, that's going to be another sort of theme on its own. We'll see if we get a little bit more volatility, not only the euro dollar, but, you know, this might be something to watch across the financial markets here. But, you know, dollar yen, 
I'm watching this as a bull flag here. We broke out of it early on this week. We stalled just ahead of that 115 handle. Uh, I'll keep a very close eye on that, which again, we failed back there early on this year after we got that meaningful sell-off to start of 2016. Got that rebound, failure at 115, and then ever since then, it's been a one-way direction. But you know, the biggest point I want to bring up here is, you know, I think there could be or we're in this sort of meaningful shift in market behavior. So you see that downward trend line in your dollar, we broken out of that. And let me make this sort of point here for the euro dollar here is we were in this bullish formation in the euro dollar from back in December. And you know, I think we got a little bit more of a convincing move after the US elections. So what do I mean by that? You know, we broke down from that, we try to come back into again trend line support region here. We got that whipsaw like price action again following the US elections. And the way I'm looking at it, maybe we're seeing former trend line support act as resistance given the recent moves again post US elections. And again, is this something similar to what's happening in the dollar yen? So the way I'm looking at it with the Top side break that we're seeing in dollar yen, the bullish flag formation panning out now, is the euro in for a bit of a catch up here? But again, we'll see what the ECB will announce next week. I'm getting a lot of questions here, guys. I'll try to take as many as I can, but we're quickly winding down to the data print here. Um, and Michael's saying here, so you were talking about cable here. Wouldn't you want to buy cable at a lower price? Uh, since it's in an uptrend, yeah, of course. But I'm talking about the data here, right, Michael? So the initial completely typed that wrong. Uh, so, you know, I tend to like event risk, can't say I trade it all the time, um, but the only thing I want to bring up on a shorter term time frame, if I'm looking at a trade setup right now for non-farm payrolls, you know, I think the levels are pretty good. So all I'm noting here is if we see a bearish US dollar reaction, given that again, key, uh, cable or pound dollar is, you know, sort of the top performer this week, I would want to favor that. You know, and that's my big point here, Michael. I'm not really trying to, you know, hold this for an extended period of time or anything, right? It's just if I'm looking to take advantage of the near-term volatility, volatility that could come about following again the non-farm payrolls print, maybe cable could be worthwhile looking at given the strength there, right? Mike says, "Got it. Awesome." And Helen, I see your question. Carlo, I see your question here, guys, but uh, let's just get through the data print first and then I'll try to uh, visit those questions. And let's bring up just a quick 15 minute chart here guys and I'll bring up dollar cat for us as well um, I'm just fix up my charts a little bit here and I'll try to read through the data as quickly as humanly possible guys uh, but just give me a quick second here and uh, Ricky asking you about dollar again have you covered it yet I was starting to um, I'll do a little bit more coverage on that and again there's a broader theme that I'm watching right now not only for FX but you know for broader financial markets so we'll keep a close eye on that and I'll talk about a little bit of that uh, here but again 180k for US non farm payrolls consensus view here and 178 guys 178 for US non farm payrolls so I would argue again just largely in line with expectations again 178k for US non farm payrolls uh, let's see here. Let me try to read through the rest of the data here. Unemployment rate holds at 4.9%. Uh, excuse me. Uh, unemployment rate unexpectedly down tick to 4.6%. And I'm trying to get the rest of the data. Give me one second, guys. Labor force participation rate actually slipped to 627 so again, it looks as though maybe the unemployment rate ticked lower because we're seeing discouraged workers leave the labor force. So again, another downtick in the labor force participation rate. Uh, let's see here. Average hourly earnings month over month increased 0.4%. And let me see our numbers here. Slowly starting to creep in. Canada employment, 10.7K. So once again, Canada employment beat expectations. And let's just take a quick look at that market reaction here, guys. Dollar Cat showing a nice move here as Canada employment beats market expectations for fourth consecutive month in a row. And again, coming in at ten, uh, let's see here, coming in at 10.7k. I'm looking at the dynamics here. Once again, part-time positions led the advanced part-time position in Canada, increased 19.4, full-time contracted 8.7. But nevertheless, the headline Canada employment report beating market expectations, job growth increasing 10.7. And right now, initially here, I think markets are a little bit unconvinced by the data here. I'm sorry, average weekly hour, uh, earnings, excuse me, month over month contracted 0.1%. So to be honest, 
not sure if there's really that good of a data print here for the U.S. economy. And again, even though we're seeing headline non-farm payrolls largely in line with market expectations, again, we're seeing the downtick in the jobless rate driven by discouraged workers leaving the labor force, so not really a positive dynamic there. Uh, wage growth figures not too good on that end. So it looks like the markets are a little bit shaken up by some of the data prints here. Can't say we're seeing a very clear-cut reaction here, but given the initial sort of bearish dollar response, and you know what, let's take a quick look at dollar in here as well. Again, sort of bearish dollar response here. We'll see if we could gather some some momentum here. <clears throat> but just be careful, guys. We are going into the weekend. We're starting up a fresh month of trade here. So I'm really inclined to watch what's going to happen next week, this monthly opening range strategy, if you will. You know, we'll see what sort of ranges we carve out for some of these. Um, major exchange rates and Alisa was asking so is the US data good here mm, I wouldn't agree it's very mixed right so you know one thing that I think we got to remember for headline non-farm payrolls is this sort of stigma that with again the Federal Reserve uh, largely on its way to normalize monetary policy and remember US economy approaching full employment you know I don't really think it's the headline numbers markets are looking at and there's just been sort of argument as long as the number is not terrible, right? It's good enough to keep the Fed on course to raise rates, right? I think that's been the sort of dynamic with, again, the headline print. But, you know, when you look at what's happening with, again, the overall labor force participation rate, right? Discouraged workers are leaving the labor labor pool. It's not a good dynamic, right? And again, we're not really seeing those steady pickup in household earnings. So I think that's a bit of concern here. But um, for now, I think it's a nice reaction here. And you know, for now, I, I would say, given, again, the bearish US dollar re response, let me bring back cable here. Let me just bring up a daily chart here. So for now, again, uh, I see our dollar. Let me just bring back cable. So you do like the response. Just watch the weekly highs from where we are, the December highs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but again, is this what we're trying to do is carve out the opening monthly range here? I'm watching, again, for a closing price above one 26.30, 126.20 zone here for a little bit more of a meaningful advance. And uh, to be honest, for you short ter shorter term traders, feel free to tack on a new retracement. Talked about this earlier this week. I took this all from my charts here. Didn't really want to clear it up, but you, you could stretch it all the way up into this 126.70, 26.80 zone here, the 50% retrace of that. The 32 doesn't come in until, again, 28.50, 28.60. So we'll see if a little bit more of a meaningful topside move in cable. But again, the biggest signal that I'm watching for right now, guys, Again, as the December trade unravels here, is are, is cable really trying to break out at this longer term bearish RSI formation? Is that going to highlight a further advance in the change rate, right? And PW here asking, any comments on uh, the uh, Italian referendum due out on Sunday? I don't want to speculate what's going to happen with the vote, right? Um, I, I just feel as though not too many market participants are, um, again, I think it's not taking as much as attention as the UK referendum because it's very different from the UK referendum, right? It's not like Italy's trying to leave the EU. It's more of an internal thing, right, where they're going to uh, change the bicameral house, right, the legislation there. So we'll see how all that will go. The way I'll look at it, I'll just give you market consensus or sort of the themes that I'm seeing PW is, you know, if it's a no vote, I think there's some... Uh, speculation that the euro might trade a little bit heavier, right, that it may sort of bring back this sort of fear that, you know, is the euro area going to decouple, right, with the UK leaving? Is this going to cause more issues for the stability of the monetary union? Uh, and again, vice versa, yes vote, right, it would help, again, Italy try to pass through all these structural reforms that they need to get through. So maybe that could be seen as positive. But uh, to be honest, PW, I think the big one next week or going into next week won't really be the Italian referendum. Again, I think we could see some volatility. So I'm glad you brought that up. For, so for those of you that have positions right now, be careful, especially if you have euro exposure. I'm already assuming, again, depending on the outcome, what happens, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see a lot of gaps when the market opens, at least Sunday, more, uh, Sunday, Sunday evening here in New York, especially given the referendum. So uh, that's all I want to lay out. But the bigger sort of theme I'm watching next week, PW, is going to be ECB. And why is this so important? Uh, they are going to make a decision on the deadline for the QE program. So just to keep everyone updated on what's happening there, March 2017 is the deadline for the QE program. 
So if they don't decide to extend the deadline this time around, what is going to be the big theme going into 2017 for Euro area? Taper tantrum, right? I think that's market speculation right now. However, I think sort of consensus views that ECB will deliver. Maybe we'll get that whatever it takes sort of approach from Mr. Mario Draghi again. But I think market consensus right now is looking for the ECB to <laughs> extend the QE program by at least six months, maybe till the tw uh, end of 2017. And, you know, we may see that drag on the euro dollar here. But <clears throat> let me just spend a second here to go through a theme that I'm talking about. And you know, this goes back to... Um, sort of what's happening with dollar yen as well. And Carla, I know you were asking about Kiwi dollar before, so I'll try to get into that as well. But again, I think these thing, uh, two things are moving in tandem where we're seeing, again, the yen weakness accompanied by the euro weakness, right? Why is this happening? And I see Ricky asking you about this right now is, so right now I'm watching this bull flag, bear flag in euro dollar. Is the euro dollar going to follow what's happening here with the dollar yen? And you know what, uh, Ricky, just to sort of give you a better picture of what I'm talking about. I'm just going to pull up a chart here, take a look at it, and you'll see how similar they look, right? So this is the Nikkei 225, right? If you look at dollar yen, you look at Nikkei 225, they're pretty much moving in tandem. What does this tell me? What is driving the Nikkei 225? I mean, what is driving the yen? And again, correlation is not causation, right? So just remember that. But one thing that this tells me, and even with this one, bull flag, we broke out of it, right? Oops, I didn't want to do the pitchfork, but uh, it looks as though risk sentiment is, at least on my end, the big driver that's not only influencing, again, global benchmark equity indices, but also it's definitely, I think, influencing currency prices as well, and even commodity prices as well, right? So I'll talk a little bit about that, but watch the Nikkei 225. If you guys want any sort of direction, I think this is the one to watch for the dollar yen. Um, and again, accompanied by what's happening in the euro dollar as well. Um, so I think there's a theme going on with the dollar, with the Federal Reserve and with rising interest rate expectations, rising U.S. yield, is the U.S. dollar becoming more of a risk currency now, right? And I think that's the theme markets are going back and forth upon, again, with the Federal Reserve, really the only central bank, major central bank now that's raising the benchmark interest rate, right, moving away um, really from their accommodative monetary policy stance. Is the U.S. dollar, again, acting more as a risk-sensitive currency, or you know, does it benefit now when risk appetite is moving higher? And, and again, is that why we're seeing what we are um, in the euro dollar, in the dollar yen, right? And just to reinforce my point about here, here's another disconnect, or here's something that's sort of disconnecting right now. And um, I'll get to Q in just a second. <laughs> Appreciate your patience. Uh, Carlo, but here's what's happening in gold. I know gold's taking a lot of attention given the sell-off here, right? But dollar strength risk is, risk appetite is up. And again, whether you want to talk about rising U.S. yields, is that why gold is, you know, really getting pushed lower right now? But here's, you know, what I want to talk about. Gold, silver, they're moving in tandem, right? Which again, I like to look at these two commodities as Again, they tend to act as commodities, right? But there are times where they act as a currency, right? A hedge against fiat currencies. So again, maybe that's the dynamic. But here's the, here's the, here's the kicker for you guys. And this is what screams to me is risk appetite really driving everything. Look at copper. Not sure if you guys have been missing out on this, but it broke out out of this year-long holding pattern. Uh, take it for what it's worth, guys, but I just feel as though a lot of people are really trying to make sense of all this. Why is gold, silver tumbling, and why is copper skyrocketing? And again, maybe more of a function of U.S. yields, risk appetite, and again, is there a, dyna a more meaningful shift right now that's happening in market behavior, right? That's what I want to bring up to you. Um, that's what I think is going on right now. So, you know, even with the ECB next week, right, we'll see what the ECB will announce. But again, is your more influence right now? by risk sentiment here, and you know, Elisa is asking, Ashley here says, so if the Italian referendum says yes, vote, would that push um, the euro? And again, I wouldn't look at it more fundamentally, right, Elisa? The way I would look at it, if the Italian referendum passes, I think it would be overall a net positive for the euro area, a net positive for Italy, right, to help them get through, uh, again, some of these uh, structural reforms, help solidify, you know, or really dampen the risk of a euro area breakup. So I think it would be risk positive, so if it is risk positive, it might be euro negative, right? Do you see what I'm getting at? Fundamentally, it, it should be good for the euro, but if risk sentiment is driving the euro lower, the, the positive risk dynamic, if that's driving the euro lower, maybe 
the euro won't hold up if, again, we get a yes vote. So again, I need to see the reaction. I need to see the results over the weekend. But right now, Elisa, that's what I'm really looking at. Is there a meaningful shift in market dynamics, a market behavior right now? And Ricky was also asking, Dalian, I thought it was moving in lockstep with 10-year yields, but good correlation with the Nikkei 225. Didn't see that one before. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Nikkei 225 and the Dalian has had this historical relationship, but right now, you know, as you've seen, they are moving pretty much in tandem. So I think we need to keep close on that one as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, Vitor was at, uh, noting here, hopefully they, uh, the vote won't bring down the Italian government and set up an exit from the euro. I mean, uh, we'll see because um, the prime minister has pretty much his, uh, again, he, he might share a similar fate to Mr. Cameron where if, again, we get a no vote, he might have to step down and we're going to have to get some new leadership in, you know, in Italy. So uh, I don't know. I don't want to speculate too much on what's going to happen with the vote. All I want to note is what is driving markets? So depending on the outcome, what sort of market reactions can we expect, right? And that's sort of the, the stance I'm in right now. But it's going to be a very interesting week, not only with the Italian referendum on tap this weekend, but also with the ECB next week, I think. And uh, PW was saying, Copper, couldn't it be looked as a coal mine canary for demand and a positive indicator? Well, here's all these stories that I'm hearing about copper. Oh, China is doing so well. There's a pickup again in China. That's why copper prices are rising. I don't buy it. Right. Yes, we had some uh, PMI figures out of China this week, better than expected, but there's a lot of issues going on in China right now. Not only that, if you look at what all these major central banks are saying, um, the RBNZ is the one that stands out the most, to me at least. They are very concerned about the uncertainty surrounding the global economy, whether you want to talk about Brexit, whether you want to talk about the future of what's going to happen, again, with the U.S. fiscal policy, right? I think that's the big discussion right now. How will the U.S. budget look going forward? What's happening in Latin America? hyperflation in Venezuela, you know, recession in some of these regions, and you look at what's happening globally on emerging market basis, even in Asia Pacific region, I don't think it's too well right now, you know, I'm watching what's happening in Singapore, Malaysia, all these regions, uh, doesn't look too rosy for me. So, you know what, that's my argument, PW, I think the global economy is not doing too well, so those headlines that I'm seeing that, oh, copper's being driven or the advance was because global growth is improving, I kind of don't buy it, and, and personally, the way I'm looking at it, I think it's more of a function of what's happening with market sentiment. And again, given the fact that we've broken out of this holding pattern, all I want to note here is, is there a change in behavior now, right? That's all I want to note, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rob saying here, copper is up because Trump plans to build a lot more in the USA. My friend, Rob, elections was up here. This broke out way before elections, right? So again, I'm just letting price tell me what's happening here. Not these headlines, but again, election was all the way out here. We broke out a couple of days before that, right? So keep that in mind, my friend, right? Uh, a lot of comments here, guys. Uh, and I'll try to run through, uh, as promised, let me cover Kiwi Dollar real quickly before I forget. So even with this one, I'm trying to get a cleaner picture of what's happening on a broader bias. So initially, I thought maybe this was a very ugly looking bull flag formation right now. But the fact that we're struggling to preserve this bullish formation from the beginning of the year, the bull trend line for the Kiwi Dollar, is this also highlighting a change in market behavior? Right. Uh, so for now, I know there was all this talk about is this an in, uh, head and shoulders hopping formation. When we broke above that left shoulder, for me, this sort of move negates the risk of a head and shoulders formation. Right. So this is where I need to see a little bit more clarity. Again, it might still be a bull flag formation. I don't know. It might just be a very ugly looking bull flag formation right now. But for me to have a little bit more of a bullish bias, especially on a longer term horizon, is you know we've seen this sort of RSI bear structure here in place really since the summer months, right? So this is where I think again is this really just a very complex topping formation that's going on the Kiwi dollar. We'll see what's going to happen. Uh, but again, despite the strength that we're seeing, and here's another theme I want to bring up here: despite the strength that we're seeing in risk sentiment, right? And you know we're seeing that pickup in the Nikkei 225. Uh, U.S. equities market. The European equities are lagging a little bit. I saw a question about the DAX. I'll try to get to it in just a second here. But again, I need some clarity. And you know what's going on here, right? If risk sentiment is picking up, why aren't currencies, higher beta currencies like the Kiwi dollar, like the Aussie dollar, why are they not benefiting from the recent move in risk appetite? And even the Aussie dollar is this suggestive of a behavior change 
as we broke down from that bullish trend from early on this year. What's going on? Right? And I think this is taking a lot of markets by confusion, and this is where I want to know, is the dollar now acting as more of a risk-sensitive currency, a higher-yielding currency now, and is it taking sort of a different role given where we are globally? One more chart, or a few more charts I just want to run into, that again tells me, is there a bigger shift in risk behavior? Aussie yen, um, to be honest with you guys, I've been going back and forth with a lot of guys on the desk here. I was very bearish on this, right? We were talking about this trend line, that 200-day moving average all year long. We finally broke out of this 2014 trend post. And, and again, Rob, you're talking about U.S. elections. This is the one that I think really is telling about what has the U.S. elections done to markets. Look at that. Broke out of the 14, 2014 trend, did a bit of a gut check here, clear breakaway. And, you know, the way I like to look at the Aussie end, carry, uh, carry paid pair du jour, right? So when I'm looking at this pair, also I get a hint of resentment behind all the fundamentals, of course, but is this highlighting a shift in market behavior, right? One more, QEN. Broke out of this long-term bearish trend too. I mean, this one has been uh, pretty crazy here, but we're coming up to some key levels right now, right? We've broken down from initial bullish structure here, but we're still preserving this sort of longer dating one that I have from back in September. Uh, but the one thing I want to sort of mention here, one thing I just want to mention about the yen pairs is that they're heavily overbought. And before I sign off here, guys, just watch that RSI. You know, there's such big misconception that because it's overbought, we need this pullback. It's exhausted. It's actually quite the contrary. When that RSI holds above 70, it's very suggestive that this bullish momentum is actually gathering pace, right? So we need not only maybe that textbook definition move back below 70 to see a pullback, but for, for me to have the conviction that we're in for a reversal here, any sort of meaningful pullback is I need this bullish structure to break down, right? And you can see this across the different yen pairs, and I'll go back to the dollar yen, right, um, is again, look at that RSI. Yes, slight the, uh, divergence right now, even though we're getting a higher high in price, but as long as that RSI holds above 70, right, I need to watch and favor the top side. And, you know, let's talk about the last time we got this overbought read for the dollar yen, which is back in May of last year. We got that overbought read, and then, again, the day we sort of had that overbought read, we were trading right around 123.20 zone. That overbought reading continued, and then dollar yen stretched all the way up to 125.80, right? So just keep everything in context, guys. The last time we had this sort of meaningful overbought reading here, was back in May of last year, where again we saw dollar yen really stretch through the yearly highs on that move. Right, so I'll just leave it there. And again, guys, I I'm sorry that you know I'm running out of time. I wish I had some more time here to cover all the questions here, uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed the overview. I'll be back next Wednesday, where I have a little bit more time just to talk about you know these dynamics, what I think, some pairs that I like watching right now. Uh, but again, we'll see how the opening monthly range for December will continue to pan out next week, especially with the ECB on tap. Um, but with that, guys, again, caution going into the weekend, Italian referendum. Thank you, PW, for reminding me about that. Good discussion on that. Uh, so again, remember about that. So careful with, it, with your exposure, especially your exposure going into the weekend. But I hope everyone has a great weekend. Best of luck on all your trades. And I hope to see you all again next week to do this all over again.